all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so the discussion today we're going to talk about the commotio cordis or the sudden cardiac uh, ventricular fibrillation usually in young men boys average age 15 years where usually a strike on their chest especially on the left center of the left ventricle um, about 30 pound force up to 50 pound force can trigger ventricular arrhythmias so that is one that we'll discuss then we i also so today is more of a news roundup because happy new year we've been absent for some time so then we will talk about a new possibility for drug for covid which is a drug that is used very commonly for bile stones it's a liver cytoprotective drug we'll talk about that we'll talk about a study which shows surprisingly i'm not sold on this one but i want to share it with you which shows that zinc may be responsible for fungal infections this study is for the india's black fungus outbreak and then finally a discussion just an overview of a study that shows that ba45 and xbb that is now a day is becoming prevalent in the us these variants especially ba45 in some cases or in one person out of 10 that were part of the study uh, had escaped memory t cells or t cell almost 78% or more so these are the interesting um updates that i wanted to share with you so let's start and once again happy new year to everyone i hope and pray that your this year is amazing much better than the last 3 years i was thinking yesterday that now i have i'm almost 53 now and 3 years of my very important part of life are gone in covid and so is the case for many so i wish that we are delivered from covid and we continue moving on with our lives and thrive and excel and and be happy so that is my prayer for all of you let's start so this is drbean.com we have finally decided that we will sell dr bean courses as courses instead of access to everything and so this is going to be just last two or three weeks my tech team is ready by the mid of this month to roll out the courses page but they're still writing some code so they'll still have to do some testing so it's second or third week we'll switch to courses and we will not have lifetime type access so anyone who has access now will continue to have the access will grandfather them but any further sales will be for the courses so maybe take advantage of this now let's start with the commotion cordis so this is the commotion or disturbance in heart so let me quickly explain how this happens and um, with this uh, young boy with this uh, players situation this has become a more talked about topic i don't want to conjecture for a patient who is in a hospital we should respect their situation i'm going to talk about the commotion cordis and what does this mean so for our okay so for our ekg we have a p wave then we have qrs complex and then we have a t wave a p wave qrs complex and then a t wave the the way this works is if you i'm going <laughs> to i think i've become now popular for my weird examples but imagine if my face is a heart and so above the eye levels are atrium there are two chambers here atrium 
<laughs> maybe empty and then below that are two cham chambers that are ventricles so what happens is this side is negative heart this side is negative and this side is positive when we are checking for ekg and heart actually is also it, the impulse travels from negative towards positive so anyways the basic idea is the impulse starts somewhere over here in the sa node and then both atria receive the electrical activity and they contract together as a unit then there is a slight delay from atria to ventricle before ventricles would contract the reason for that delay is that we want atria to contract first and pour the last part of some blood in the ventricles so kick the blood into the ventricle then atria are done they can now relax while ventricle would start contracting and pushing the blood out when the ventricles contract what happens is there is electrical activity so imagine my this part of the face is ventricles all of this part if i contract my muscles they all get electrical activity together and they all contract together that is called an electrical syncytium or a unit electrical unit so once the the whole heart contracts the ventricle contracts that pushes the blood out then the ventricle relaxes in the meantime atria had relaxed and filled up so by the time the ventricle relaxes atria contract again and push the blood again and this cycle continues so now if i go back to this diagram here this qrs complex is the electrical wave when ventricles are contracting then after that the t wave is ventricular depolarization or when ventricles would start relaxing now half of the t wave here from q wave to half of the t wave this part is called absolute refractory time what that means is that we already have a wave traveling in the heart electrical wave we do not want one more wave so during this time the heart is refractory it cannot have one more electrical impulse or it should not have one more electrical impulse then from for the second part of the t wave we call it relative refractory time ideally during this time there should not be an electrical activity or uh, repolarization actually polarization but it can occur if there is a little more force or a little more uh, excitation as we call it in the electrical systems heart is my favorite as well so here what happens is this t wave if i increase the size of this our focus is on this t wave this t wave is the indicator that heart ventricles are now relaxing electrical activity is is uh, not excitation anymore we call it depolarization depolarization means the electrical activity is going back to its resting state now during this ventricular contraction when polarization occurred and then as the depolarization is occurring this very tiny time this very tiny band of time this time is the dangerous window this is 30 milliseconds before the peak of the t wave so 30 milliseconds somewhere over here from there to 10 milliseconds before the t wave this time of the heart's repolarization is sensitive during this time they had done these experiments in i believe 1930s where they anesthetize rabbits and other animals and they hit their chest and see the fibrillations occurring so what happens is during this time 
if there is especially for the youngsters because their chest cavity hasn't yet become very strong and it is still flexible so for the youngsters and especially boys and and that is not because women have some uh, or girls have some um, aversion that this cannot happen in them it's just that their sports are not as um, combative for example the uh, baseball or but if a woman is taking part in such contact sports then she can have it too so it's not that she cannot it's just that m- more boys i think nowadays uh, women are girls are taking part in these sports as well so when there is a strike a baseball at the left side of the chest in the middle of the left ventricle a baseball that strikes here or if an elbow strikes here or if there is any other strike that causes a thump a mechanical pressure on the left ventricle so if i make ventricles two ventricles this is the left ventricle this side in the center of the left ventricle if there is a contact here actually i should make it here it is usually at this area so here if there is a contact then what happens is there are so nobody has discussed this there are in the cardiac electrical system that includes the cardiac muscle and the cardiac nervous tissue modified specialized muscle that acts like a nerve in that nerve of course we all know who are in medicine that what happens is so let's say this is the cell and this is the end of it in the cell for an electrical impulse there are channels these channels allow for example sodium to go in in the cardiac muscles for example calcium goes in and then chloride can come out potassium can come out there are sodium potassium atps channels so there are various kinds of channels that allow various electrolytes to move when the heart is excited we do you know that we still do not know exact mechanism of commotio cordis or the cardiac um, disruption and then defibrillation uh, fibrillation however it is thought that as there is the impact on the heart these channels here are some of them are mechano channels or mechanical channels what does that mean think about it for a second with me imagine you have a balloon and you puncture that bal- balloon with a needle then if you stretch the balloon that little needle dot that you punctured that will become bigger because of stretching similarly when there is an impact and there is a stretch of a tissue or there is a jerk to the tissue these channels can accidentally open up so that is a mechanical effect of opening up the excitation channels and when that happens the sodiums or the calciums they start moving into the cell and all of a sudden there is an excitation now this is a very interesting exceptional mechanism because usually as i said before during this repolarization and uh, sorry depolarization heart is in a refractory state these channels normally do not open but if you impact them they can under that mechanical thud they can open up and when they open up they can create one more one more impulse here so that means this qrs channel or this qrs wave or complex we call it that indicates heart's excitation or polarization that would appear here and the problem is if there is let me make it this so here was a t wave this was the qrs complex there was a p wave here there is another qrs complex that would appear here this is called r on t phenomena that this was actually a t wave and unfortunately on that t wave 
which is a depolarization time, re relaxation time, a repolarization or polarization time occurred. Another impulse occurred. Heart was relaxing. It went back to contracting. Now, this causes, again, this is not discussed very much. What this causes is that if I make the heart again, let's say ventricles, Now, the ventricles were becoming depolarized. That means their electrical activity was going back to the resting state. All of a sudden, a strike causes the ventricles to become polarized again where they should not be. So now some tissue is polarized. Some tissue is in depolarization state. And what happens is there is a competition between them and the polarization and depolarization start running around disjointed within the heart muscles. Ideally, in normal hearts, what happens is there is a contraction or polarization that occurs throughout the heart ventricles together. Then there is a relaxation that occurs together as a unit. But here, some part of the ventricle is depolarized and some part is now polarized. That disjointment allows the electrical waves to just start running around uncontrolled. That would cause then fibrillation of the heart. And when heart is fibrillation, ventricular fibrillation occurs, then the cardiac pumping is finished. So the thing that I wanted to add to the understanding of commotion cordis is the mechanical impact causing a polarization on top of depolarization resulting in disarrayed electrical activity of the heart, which then causes fibrillation. Now, this fibrillation would, of course, reduce the or eliminate the cardiac output. And when the cardiac output is eliminated, of course, we all know when, the, when there is no oxygen supply to the tissue, especially brain, then the patient is in trouble. The survival rate used to be very low early on in last years, I believe 30% or so. However, since 2006 onwards, it has actually improved to 58% because of the availability, number one, more people knowing CPR, and number two, defibrillators becoming more and more available. Now, usually in commotio cordis, there is no cardiac damage heart doesn't become damaged. It just becomes disarrayed electrically and it can be brought back by, defib by defibrillating it. And when it is brought back, usually, if it has not stayed in that state for a very long time, it can come back and start operating normally without any problem. However, if that time span is more, then brain will have a problem with oxygen heart itself needs lots of oxygen. So then it depends how long the heart was fibrillating and was not pumping oxygen and which tissues did not receive correct amounts of oxygen and what kind of damage is present. So that is the, <clears throat> that is commotio cordis. Happens mostly in younger uh, athletic boys. This is different from sudden cardiac death where the interventricular uh, hypertrophy in athletes especially occurs that can cause sudden cardiac death of the athlete. So what happens is very quickly that mechanism, what happens is it's a genetic problem. My um, One of my friend's brother has it and he never knew until he was I believe 35 or so. So what happens is that in the heart, so if I draw this diagram of atria, so I want to, and let's say this is ventricle. So this is not anatomically correct, just functionally. So from here, let's say we have aorta coming out of heart. So let me clean this a little bit. So aorta comes out from the left ventricle. Now where the mouth of aorta starts, the opening of the aorta starts, 
that is where the inter- the ventricle is just sitting interventricular septum or the wall between the two ventricles just sits there now in some uh, folks especially athletes just like when we do our exercises our muscles can build up in some athletes unfortunately when they do exercises and games their cardiac interventricular septum starts building up like a biceps of a bodybuilder the remaining heart is fine but just this part starts building up which then causes slowly it starts growing in front of the aorta so normally the patient doesn't even know that i have interventricular hypertrophy and then at some time when they're playing a game and they are doing rigorous exercise and the heart is running fast and they need to pump out a lot of blood in very quick successions because their heart rate has become double or more at that time because the amount of blood because of the very quick cardiac cycles heart is beating so fast that very small amount of blood comes in and very quickly it has to go out during that time it is possible that this ventricular septum actually obstructs the mouth of aorta and the patient can just drop dead and so such patients usually find out if they're not athletes and they're not sports people they usually find find out later in the age because this septum continues to grow disproportionately to the rest of the body rest of the heart and so 30 40 years of age they find out that they have a problem and then they need to be managed otherwise the cardiac system starts going in trouble so this particular commotio cordis has nothing to do with this this can cause sudden cardiac death however this is causing a disruption because of mechanical impact to the electrical system so that is one uh, quick concept i wanted to discuss then let's see the next one so here if you see commotio cordis the impact here is the diagram for that one they have uh, this is a cellular mechanism mechano receptors then it happens in sports impact factors are important treatment is usually defibrillate and then if there is any tissue damage you have to then work with that tissue and this is an interesting example here legal issue several people have been charged and convicted for the death of victims of commotio cordis even when the blows rendered were never given with an intent to kill in 1992 italian hockey player miran schrott died after a blow to his chest from the stick of italian canadian player jimmy boni boni was charged with the culpable homicide and eventually pleaded guilty to manslaughter paying a 1300 fine and 175000 restitution to schrott's family so this is commotio cordis next this is a very interesting study it was sent to me by sean berkovitz and john who is a i believe friend of sean so both of them sent this to me uh, so thank you very much it is interesting the study is this a liver drug reduces sars cov2 entry into the cells and this is a very common liver drug that is used so here or so deoxycholic acid or udca why is this drug used in some patients who may have bile stones and who do not want to undergo surgery or cannot undergo surgery they are usually given or so deoxycholic acid to try to dissolve those uh, stones it actually reduces the cholesterol uh, levels and actually protects what they say is that if the cholesterol is too or the bile actually is more concentrated it can cause damage to the surfaces of the cells the bile system cells in which it is flowing so acid deoxycholic acid is protective as well anyways what they found was very interesting let me show you for sars cov2 they found was that UDCA reduces the expression of ACE2 in our on our cells that that is a very interesting mechanism uh, 
So what they did was they gave UDCA to uh, organoids, lung organoid. So that is the lung tissue formed in the lab. And they gave it UDCA and there were less expression of ACE2. Then they actually tried it on the on the patient's lungs that have been removed for other reasons. And here is what they found. I have to open this door because Kyrie is just scratching it. So give me one second, please. Okay. So Kyrie is here. Don't mind me if I start protecting my arms because nowadays she has found a new way of coming in and scratching my arms. Okay, so back here. This diagram is very interesting. This part is normal saline used as a placebo. And this is an organoid. So this is the separation of the lungs and then they put the lung in an experimental system and then they, uh, they used the ursodeoxycholic acid. So here, in these cells, let me see if I can make it bigger. Okay. And so if you see here, <laughs> hey, Kyrie, B, this little box here, this is the diagram of the alveolar sacs. That is the airway, the terminal part of the airway where the gas exchange occurs in our lungs. This is the histology of that. And in here, inside this box, if you see on the right side of it, the red ones are the ACE2 expression and the white dots are the infection by the virus. Then on the right side, this is the UDCA treated lung tissue. And if you see the diagrams on the right here, more focused area, you would see that very few red and almost negligible infection. So just this little white and one white here. So what they observed was that when they gave UDCA, the result was that ACE2 expression reduced and the expression reduction would then cause less ACE2 to be available to uh, SARS-CoV-2, which in turn caused less infection. So Kyrie just came in and sat right here. Actually, she's going to pass right in front of the camera now. So my apologies. She has her tail here as well. Hey, Kyrie. Okay. So this is the other very interesting study. Not other. This is a very important study. There is another interesting study I'm going to show you. So if you see here, immunofluorescence images of alveoli, air sacs, showing that the level of ACE2 red and evidence of SARS-CoV-2 infection, white particles were reduced in the UDCA-treated lung compared with the control. So that is one. And I have links in the de uh, description of this video if you wanted to read more about this. And how does the uh, ursodeoxycholic acid works? Then, continuing. This is the study which kind of made me um, amazed. And this study is multicenter case control study of COVID-19 associated mucormycosis outbreak in India. So black fungus, I remember doing a couple of uh, lectures about this when this outbreak was occurring. And at that time, my, my apologies, I'm kind of tackling Kyrie here as well. She's running around because she wants to now sit down in my lap. And uh, till she gets her way, she's... Okay, so my apologies. So multicenter case control study. What they found was in this study that glucocorticoids or steroid use, rural area, and some other factors, diabetes, were factors in patients developing mucormycosis or black fungus. However, they also found that zinc was an independent factor. So here, this, this blows my mind, but actually I understand one of the, let's start with the statement first, which is in the limitations. In the limitations, the first limitation of our study is that data were collected during the peak of the pandemic with limited resources and some information was missing as a result. Now check this one out. Although our study supports the definite 
association of glucocorticoids with CAM, CAM being COVID associated mucormycosis or black fungus because associated with COVID. The same might not be accurate for zinc. Zinc might be synergistic to glucocorticoids or other factors in the development of CAM. So they're saying that maybe zinc's presence caused glucocorticoids to have a higher impact than Kyrie's tail, and that may have caused the steroids to be more effective and suppressing immune system or causing more black, black fungus. However, if you go up here, there is a very interesting thing. They say, we also found zinc supplementation an independent factor associated with CM. So they, in the limitations, they said that, hey, this may be through glucocorticoids, but here they're discussing that from data, it doesn't mean, it doesn't need that a patient was on glucocorticoids or not. As long as they had zinc, they were at a greater risk of developing black fungus. So a small study suggested a protective role of zinc in CAM. So they are referring three studies. One of the study suggested that zinc actually is protective against fungus. However, the other two studies found an association between zinc and CAM, again, COVID-associated mucormycosis. The biologic plausibility and in vitro evidence of abundant growth of mucor, mucorail strains demonstrated on zinc supplemented media support the possible role of zinc in causing CAM. So what they're saying is that they placed a medium which were given zinc, a culture, blood culture or others, and zinc was present. Then they put fungus on it and the fungus grew. So they said that in this study, in these two studies, they found that zinc's presence allowed the fungus to grow independent of glucocorticoids or independent of other factors, for example, diabetes, etc. Just independently, this was a factor. That is amazing for me to realize. <laughs> there is the <laughs> Kyrie's face. Do you see Kyrie's face? She's not going to leave me alone today. So here, and she's very... <laughs> Kairi, how is life? Okay. In the beginning, Luffy used to be here a lot. And I used to talk with Luffy while doing these lectures. And somebody left a comment under a video saying, I would never want to talk about talk or listen to a lecture from a crazy doctor who talks with animals. <laughs> so here is Kairi once more. Kairi, I'm doing a lecture. And, and you are making people think I'm a crazy doctor. Okay, so now she's in my lap. That's what she wanted. So here is her tail. She's here. Okay, so the biological plausibility and in vitro evidence of abundant growth of mucorails strain demonstrated on zinc supplemented media supports a possible role of zinc in causing CAM. So I thought this was very interesting. What is the outcome of this one? More, I think, is an interesting piece of information to keep in mind to not overdo on zinc. But I don't think this is sufficient evidence to be able to say we need to make a decision based on this evidence. She has a tail over here. <laughs> That's my life. Now she's licking my hands. Okay, so this is the zinc study. Moving on to the next one. This is a bigger study. I will actually do a deeper dive on this one, but I want to give you an idea for this as well. This is a very interesting study. SARS-CoV-2 Omicron BA4, BA5 mutations in spike leading to T-cell escape in recently vaccinated individuals. So what are they talking about? They're saying that we know that as we have, sorry, I have Kyrie here in my lap and I have to draw. So imagine this is the, um, let's say, dendritic cell, right? And next to the dendritic cell is a helper T cell. 
and there is this dendritic cell presenting pieces of spike protein or other parts of the virus to the helper T cell. And then we know that helper T cell binds with this structure and through its own receptor called T cell receptor, right? So this is T cell receptor. This is MHC2. And so once the T cell, helper T cell binds here, it is not letting me draw nicely and beautifully. So just live with this one, please. So here is a helper T cell. This helper T cell then in turn, we know goes T helper two pathway or T helper one pathway. T helper two pathway would cause antibodies. So that is the humoral pathway. T helper one pathway would go cytotoxic route. And that is the cytotoxic pathway, CD8 positive pathway. What they found was, if somebody was given, I'm, I'm simplifying, it's a beautiful detailed study. I'm simplifying the message. If somebody had two um, doses of messenger RNA vaccine, to the original wild type variant, then their T helper system had less response to BA4 and BA5 variants. So there were enough spike protein mutations that when BA4 or BA5 were, or even they mentioned in their study, even XBB, when they are introduced in the body of a recently vaccinated person, then the T cells were imprinted. I'm using the word imprinted. They didn't use it. The T cells were imprinted with the Wuhan variant spike epitopes or knowledge. And they there was less cross-reactivity to BA4 and 5 from vaccinated individuals. In one case, so there were just 10 people, so it's a small study. In one case, in one vaccine, they actually said one or more because the percentage, they're going with the percentage of the samples. So it could be one or more, but let's just use one out of 10. In one case, 78% of the cross reaction was gone meaning was not effective. So you could say that that patient almost did not respond at all. And if the T, and these were T helper cells that were not responding. If the T helper were not responding correctly, then T helper two pathway or T helper one pathway, both pathways will be impacted. So antibody response and cytotoxic response, both will be impacted. And so they thought that that will be an interesting thing, although their conclusion was interesting, they made two conclusions. One, they said, it is important to not give, I'm paraphrasing them, it is important to not give Wuhan type vaccine, instead bivalents are better. I guess now XBB, so if we keep this study in mind, then XBB vaccine has to be there. The second thing they said was very interesting, that is this. They said, as the mutations are occurring in the, as the mutations are occurring in the BA uh, or Omicron lineage, BA1 is protective towards BA4 and 5, but not BA4, 5 protective backwards towards Delta. And we actually discussed that study. They said, if now XBB, which is going to be maybe BA4 and 5 will protect for XBB, but XBB will not backwards protect. So they think we might reach, this is a speculation they're doing. They're saying we might reach a point where there is enough variation causing enough loss of cross reactivity that Delta like variants would appear new to us and we might start becoming infected again with Delta. So again, they said it's to be known. 
this is something to keep monitoring for. So it's not that I'm saying this is what they said will happen. So let me actually read what they said so that my paraphrasing does not cause any errors. So if I look for... <laughs> Nevertheless, it should be monitored whether Omicron-specific B and T-cell immune responses, if induced, do not undermine the responsiveness to more pathogenic variants like Delta. So they're saying we got to make sure that that doesn't happen, that these variations in spike, although they are protective towards next ones, and the next one are escaping the T cells. Escaping B cells and having less antibody or less neutralizing antibody is a different problem. Here they're talking about escaped T cell. And they said, if induced, do not undermine the responsiveness to more pathogenic variants like Delta. Several studies have shown that the first encounter with Omicron, either through infection or vaccination, but without a previous SARS-CoV-2 infection or vaccination, results in neutralizing response predominantly directed against Omicron with more limited neutralization against earlier variants. So what they're saying here is that there are many studies that show that if somebody has Omicron infection, then Within the Omicron family, those infections are cross-protective. And we are, you're seeing that Wuhan variant vaccine is not very helpful for cross. But these infections or vaccines are not backwards protective. So we have a couple of problems here. Again, I'm staying within the bounds of this study. And this part I'm going to speculate now. And so I could be wrong. There are a couple of problems. If you give Wuhan variant vaccine, then the Omicrons are escaping it. So cross-reactivity of T helper cells is reducing too. So if you said, all right, you know what, we're going to do bivalent vaccines or we're going to do va vaccines with Omicron. If you start doing Omicron-specific vaccines, then what would happen is that the previous variants might become less known to our body and they may attack and our body because of the lots of spike mutations our t helper cells may not recognize delta as a valid cross reacting variant and so delta might just appear as a new infection so that is what um, they thought again this is a very tiny study 10 people, one person with 78% escape, others not. And um, so really just a directional study. They say that more studies are needed. So if you see here in summary, our study shows that several BA4-5 mutations in the spike protein lead to a reduced responsiveness of epitope-specific T cells in subjects that receive two doses of mRNA vaccine based on the ancestral Wuhan spike sequence. Other currently circulating Omicron sublineages such as 275, 46, BQ1, and XBB share many of these spike mutations, making our finding also relevant for the impact of the T cell response on the emerging Omicron variants. So, this is the next Thing that I wanted to discuss. And again, this is a beautiful and an involved study. I am giving a very high level response to it. So this is the discussion. Let's see if there is any questions before we break for today. So once again, if you would like, take advantage of Dr. Bean's current price, and then we'll change it towards courses. Okay. So John says it will recombinant. It will be recombinant with MERS, and we'll get MERS too. So that is a. So I know that you had uh, done this discussion. So let me put your conjecture to the folks here. And again, this is just John thinking aloud. He was thinking about this with me as well. We don't have a study to show that this would happen, and that is that if SARS-CoV-2 newer variants accidentally picked up a different way of entering the cell, for example, DPP4 from MERS-CoV, 
then we'll have an entirely different pandemic. And that is where I believe the um, Harvard study, which folks said it was a gain of function study, that study is very interesting because they actually replaced the spike protein on the Omicron to the Wuhan variant. And they still saw that Omicron contained its milder form. So there was something more than the spike in the virus. But this is a possibility that virus can pick up a new way of binding to receptors. Then we have a new pandemic that then things are different. Okay, so let's... Jody says that is XBB failing rapid test? So Jody, give me one day. I'm going to look up and read more about XBB before I... Uh, open my mouth about that one. Okay, so Patty Zig says, how common is cardiac long QT syndrome? Is commercial cardiac related to this underlying condition? So very, very good question. So long QT syndrome is rare as well. Yes, commercial cardiac is actually related to long QT as well. Although in this case, it is not necessary that the patient has to be suffering. In the case of commercial cortis, patient doesn't have to be suffering with the long QT syndrome to have commercial cortis, although their risk of commercial cortis can increase. Similarly, players also have an increased risk of commercial cortis because when they are playing, their heart is running at double the speed or more. And because of that, the cardiac intervals are reduced. Because of that, this interval reappears fast and fast. A, an impact the heart can double the chance of, of landing on that sensitive or um, on that window. So yes, the, the Q, QRS complexes or R on T and then the polymorphic ventricular tachycardia and then fibrillation is very similar to torsades that occur with the long QT syndrome. Good question, Patty. So this is a very good question. For cardiac arrest, I was taught to give a sharp thump on the chest and then re-compressions. Re, uh, is that still valid? Yes. So this commercial cordis doesn't occur to a heart that is already stopped. This, this works on a heart or this happens to a heart which is healthy and which is not already stopped, which is actually working. Now, I missed one thing. A heart that may be sick, for example, is ischemic, may have a greater chance of developing commercial cordis compared to a, another heart. But usually healthy, athletic, young boys develop this when a baseball hits on their chest or when there is a elbow or other hit on the chest. So, um, and exactly on the middle of the left ventricle. So good question, uh, Sky. That is still valid. So, Jocelyn, I will present XBB tomorrow. So John says that we'll call it SARS-CoV-2 Two, three, but it will be SARS CoV 2 with DPP 4 binding. <laughs> Let's not <laughs> think about that one. Okay. Uh, my riddle, someone says, Have you at any point thought to yourself over the last two years, damn, the conspiracy theorists were right? No. Conspiracy theorists are still making conspiracies. Uh, ten pennies thought of every two years people would just die or um, geared ideas of just the vaccine creating um, variants. These are not uh, correct mechanisms. So Janet says that I wonder if existing cases of myocarditis are contributing to any of this. So a patient of ischemic cardiac condition could also be more at risk of commercial cordis, but usually commercial cordis occurs to the athletic 
uh, players, one more thing I forgot to say. During the commercial card, it's normally the heart doesn't get damaged. There can be impact that is forceful enough to damage the heart as well. That's a different situation. But usually there is just sufficient impact needed, which is not going to damage the heart, but still cause enough mechanical thump to disarray the electrical channels for a short time and create depolarization and polarization waves nearby in the same ventricle that was depolarizing and then fibrillation starts occurring. Cool. So with this, thank you very much. Please like, subscribe, and share. If you like this work, if I'm the guy you like to listen to, then uh, the easiest thing you can do is subscribe and share or comment. Comment actually, a good comment or a bad comment, it actually helps <laughs> because YouTube thinks that, oh man, there is comments in the video. So comment in the video if you like. And if you would like to support this work, there are links in the description. You can buy me a coffee, you can use PayPal, or you can become a patron or you can become a member of this channel. So with this, thank you very much, and I would see you again. Bye.